Hello and welcome into the 24-7 Sports Football Recruiting Podcast. I'm National Recruiting Analyst Cooper Patek, alongside 24-7 Sports Director of Scouting, Andrew Ivins. And uh, as you can tell, circumstances, uh, we are not in the office today in Nashville. We are snowed in. Andrew is moving to Orlando, so he's got a new backdrop as well. Drew, it's like we're going back all the way to our humble beginnings here on the podcast. I don't mind it at all. And we got a lot to talk about. Kalen DeBoer to Alabama. That happened on Friday. We'll talk about that. The recruiting chops. Does he have what it takes to recruit in Tuscaloosa in the SEC? We'll also get into the transfer portal as well. How about Cam Ward down to Miami? Some more happening as well. Des Ricks, we'll see what happens with him. And then Julian Lewis, the number one player in the class of 2026. Well, He's reclassifying to the class of 2025. So where does he rank? How does he fit in? We'll get into all of that. So one little thing, Drew, if you want to get right into it, we, we talked about Kalen DeBoer taking over for Nick Saban. That is not one little thing. That is one big thing, right? We're talking about a guy who's won six national championships, 10 SEC titles in his 17 years at Alabama. You just mentioned to me he had 10 number one ranked recruiting classes as well in his 17 years. Drew, the way that I think about this, I believe in Kalen DeBoer, the coach. Everywhere he's been, he's won. It doesn't matter uh, whether that's been at the FCS, FCS level, whether it's been at Fresno State, whether it's been in Washington in his first two years. I think the biggest question mark about Kalen DeBoer right now is can he recruit at a Nick Saban Alabama level? And you think about that standard. I just said the resume there for Nick Saban. For me, and I say this with all due respect, color me skeptical. And I think that would be any coach in the country outside of the name of Kirby Smart and Dan Lanning. I think I would say that if you were stepping into the shoes of Nick Saban, arguably the greatest college football coach of all time. But for me, Drew, that's the biggest question mark. Yeah, Coop. I mean, I think I was asked, I don't know, by someone on the 24-7 sports desk as soon as uh, Kalen, it was announced that he was taking over. Kind of my, my view on this is we know DeBoer is a winner. He has won at all different levels, but he's never really had to, you know, set up shop and kind of build out the roster from the ground level. Now he's going to Tuscaloosa where there's obviously already a ton of talent there, but what does that roster look like three to four years down the line? And Coop, what I think is unique about your position, right? You started your career at Alabama. You work there. Then you were at Washington. So why don't you paint for the viewers and listen? I mean, how different – are those two, I don't know, ecosystems, you know, the, the access to talent. I, I know your 2019 Washington recruiting class looks like it's going to have uh, some studs that are going to be selected early on in the NFL draft, but you've had to be at both places. I mean, I would assume, uh, you know, Washington, Alabama, a little bit different than each other. Yeah, it's an illuminating experience when you go from Alabama to Washington, especially given the circumstances of, of, of following Nick Saban, uh, eye-opening, right? We talked about Kalen DeBoer and his kind of quick ascension through the college football ranks, uh, starting where he did, uh, then the offense coordinator at Indiana and to Fresno, then to UW, now at Alabama in just a, a few short years. So in terms of the amount of pressure, I think we all know the expectation, the standard of excellence that uh, uh, that football program is held to uh, not to say that Washington didn't have expectations, but this is a completely different job in terms of recruiting expect expectations. And one thing that I will say about Kalen DeBoer, and listen, uh, over 20 wins in his first two years in Seattle, 17 of those 22 starters in the offensive defensive side of the ball, as you mentioned, came from that Chris Peterson regime, right? They, they sprinkled in guys like Michael Penix and Dylan Johnson and Jalen Polk and Jabbar Muhammad. You got to give him a hat tip and a lot of credit, especially for getting the most out of those players. Like I said, the biggest question is, is can you sustain it? And we talked about it last week. Maybe what were some of the traits that got overlooked with Nick Saban? I don't think people really fully appreciated the full scope of how good he was when it came to wearing the hat of the CEO. And then when it came to wearing the hat of the talent identification evaluation, and ultimately at the end of the day, acquisition you got to put in the work and drew you and i had a conversation about this a few days ago you said hey that alabama logo still carries a lot of weight i would argue the opposite in the fact that now we live in this very transactional world of nil and the transfer portal where it doesn't hold as much weight and in the last couple of days you've seen the decommitments from that program now with nick saban gone that alabama 
uh, program is really going to have to redefine itself, right? There's a lot of question marks about the future. What does it look like under Kalen DeBoer? And I don't really think it has to do with anything about Kalen DeBoer's coaching chops. But you got to remember, this is a guy that really hasn't even been in this footprint, right? So it's not like there's a level of familiarity when Kirby Smart went from uh, uh, Alabama to Georgia and and Mario Cristobal now at Miami, right? It's like those guys are, are recognized there. Kalen DeBoer, to a lot of these prospects and their families, is a name that up until maybe a few weeks ago when UW made that college football playoff push and, and got into the national title game, they're really not that all familiar with. So it's going to be fascinating. I think the other thing, Drew, you look at his staff, who he's brought over already, Ryan Grubb coming over as offensive coordinator, big addition, Nick Sheridan coming over as a tight ends coach, Scott Huff, uh, coming over as an offensive line coach, all of these guys have not spent a lot of time in the South. Jamarcus Shepard, I think, one of the best offensive assistants he's bringing over. And on the defensive side, how about Kane Womack? You know, those guys, I believe, cross paths at Indiana. He hires him from South Alabama. The head coach there coming over now is D.C. I think that's a big one. Drew, we'll see how it shakes out. I expected a little bit more continuity, maybe more familiar faces from the SEC. They're retaining Freddie Roach. We'll see how he fills out the rest of the staff. It's a lot of Washington flavor. And Why wouldn't you be confident if you're Kalen DeBoer? All you've done is one. The biggest thing here for me, Drew, and I keep going back to it, I keep going back to it, I keep going back to it, it's really not what is it going to look like two to three years from now? But it's once the dust settles, what is years four, five, and six going to look like? You have the most talented roster in all of college football. I am assuming they will do enough to retain those parts as well. So it's really not the first three years. I'm kind of interested to say, all right, that second wave, what is yours kind of like four through six look like? Well, I do think there's some positives, right, if you look at this through the lens of an Alabama fan. I think the first thing is we know Kalen DeBoer – has navigated the transfer portal. And there wasn't a ton of transfers that were part of this magical run for the Huskies, but there were some key pieces in in certain areas, right? Then you look at Washington's recruiting class. I, Cooper, I think it's ranked 36 for the 2024 cycle. So not where you want it to be, but to a trained eye, when you open up the hood, right, you start looking at the pieces. There's a lot of guys to like. Noah Carter, uh, who we saw at the All-American Bowl. We're big fans of him. There's a few other defensive linemen in there. Like, there are some talented players. And you could tell that Kalen DeBoer was looking for guys that had certain traits, right, uh, checked certain boxes, met certain thresholds. And, you know, was he doing it to the level that Nick Saban was in Tuscaloosa? No. Uh, but I, I think it's a guy that understands, all right, player development. We want to get guys that – fit what we want to do. So I think an Alabama fan, you got to be excited about that. The second thing is Cooper, right? You know, why is Nick Saban stepping away? I mean, there's a ton of different theories out there. I think it's him uh, or a large part of this is the current landscape with all the player movement, right? In the NIL. So I think if K I'm Kalen DeBoer, the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to my boosters, the people in the collectives and saying, Hey, right. Nick Saban's out. If you want me to go head to head with these guys, the talent in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and across the country, then we're gonna have to we're gonna have to play a little bit different than we have in the past. So I'm interested to see how that plays out uh, with DeBoer and uh, you know Cooper. I've been trying to find like a a comparison. All right, have we seen someone do this before? Come outside of the SEC footprint, right, and really establish this themselves. And this is starting to feel a little bit like Brian Kelly, year one at LSU, right. First recruiting class, super national, all around the country. He learned fast. He readjusted. And you look at what LSU did in this cycle, 2024. I mean, they have prioritized the boot. So I think Kalen DeBoer is going to take – it's going to take some time to find his bearings, get his footing, and understand, okay, this is the SEC. Final thing I'll add here, Cooper, who's benefiting from Nick Saban stepping away? I think, you know, instantly it's Georgia, right? I mean, you know, you, you remove that. Go back to two cycles ago, Justice Haynes, Caleb Downs. They're probably in Athens right now, not Tuscaloosa, if uh, if Nick Saban wasn't running the show. And, and I think you look at some of these other powers out there, a program like Ole Miss, we've seen more active in the SEC. Look at Texas and Sarkeesian. I just think a lot of programs are going to benefit from this. And, you know, I'm, I'm fired up to see what these recruiting classes look like because I think it's going to come down to how do they attack it. Are they in the transfer portal? Are they going to go through the high school ranks? We still really don't know because we haven't seen Kalen DeBoer have to set up shop and really, you know, kind of build it how he wants to. 
these teams are going to be a lot more aggressive, a lot more bold, I think, when it comes to recruiting within what would be called Alabama's footprint, right? You look at Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia as well, even in the state of Florida. You mentioned Georgia. How about teams like Florida State? How about teams like Florida under Billy Napier? You mentioned Lane Kiffin as well. I think all these teams right now, they're going to poke and prod at Kalen DeBoer, kind of see how he responds as well. It's going to be all knives out in the SEC, especially in that footprint, to see what happens. Kalen DeBoer, 37-9 and as a head coach at the FBS level. Drew, we mentioned a couple of decommitments already, a big one. How about five-star receiver Ryan Williams, who reclassed from 25 to 24? You go down the list a little bit, Jamie French, another guy that we just got to see in San Antonio. You compared a little bit to Jeremiah Smith. That just goes to show the caliber of player that we're talking about here. And Kalen DeBoer, listen, there's going to be a little bit of a grace period, but not much. I think you and I are probably looking towards the spring, what's going to happen with 2025 and beyond, and how is Kalen DeBoer going to react to that. These guys are going to get punched in the mouth. I'm, I'm telling you that this staff, and I'm not saying that, hey, everybody's gunning for you. But people are going to to try to figure out, OK, what do we have here? How are these guys going to respond? What's it going to be like? Right. What is, what is this in terms of Kalen DeBoer? How is he going to react now getting in shark infested waters? That's what you call it. So we'll wait and see. Kalen DeBoer has got his work cut out for him in the SEC. We'll see if he's up to it. Great coach on the football field. Some questions remain in terms of recruiting. I think that's pretty fair to say. Guys, every Tuesday and Wednesday, you can watch the Oyster Boys right here on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. Five o'clock Eastern time. Make sure to like and subscribe. we got everything you need. Recruiting coverage from start to finish. Just got done with the 2024 cycle. One more update to put a bow on that. And then all the way to 2025. Drew, are you ready for that? Man, it just never stops. All right, we talked a lot about Nick Saban. We talked a lot about Kalen DeBoer. And we talked about the things that make Nick Saban successful. Obviously, we know the on-the-field resume. How about the off-the-field resume? We mentioned earlier in the show, 10 out of 17 years, he had the number one ranked recruiting class in the country. So, Drew, that begs the question. A lot of classes to choose from. But if you were to go back, look through that Rolodex of 17 cycles uh, at, during Nick Saban's time in Tuscaloosa, which one is the best recruiting class ever? Uh, so this question was uh, posed to us for what Monday's college football recruiting show that got snowed out. And I threw it on our rundown because it's it's fascinating. Um, and I think there is a variety of different ways or answers to this question. I mean, what do you define his best recruiting class? Is it the one that won the most national titles? Is it the most first round NFL draft picks? I think for me, I lean more to the players that ended up hitting. And I think you go to that 2017 recruiting class, Cooper, uh, day one picks, Devontae Smith, Tua Tagovailoa, Mac Jones, Jerry Judy, Jer Jedrick Willis, Alex Leatherwood, Henry Ruggs, Najee Harris. So what is that? Eight or nine first round picks. You had a few guys on day two, day three. So 2017, I think, is where I gravitate towards. But uh, the more I dug into this, I, I think you can make some cases for some of these other recruiting classes. Uh, 2016, you know, a few more first rounders, Quinnen Williams, Jonah Williams, Josh Jacobs, Trevon Diggs, Jalen Hurts, Raquan Davis, Irv Smith, Terrell Lewis, Mac Wilson. To me, 2016 feels a little bit different through my lens. And Cooper, the reason is, that 2016 group, only one of those guys was a consensus five-star. Uh, Diggs, Hurts, both outside the top 100. Josh Jacobs, a three-star recruit. Uh, Irv Smith, a three-star recruit. To me, that shows talent ID and then and then player development. So I don't know where you're going to go with this. I, I mean, I can keep going. There's, there's a variety of different ways to look at it. Yeah, I'm going to go with 17. I mean, you think about 17, Devontae Smith, all pro, to a tag of Iloa. You talked about Mac Jones. That was that two-quarterback class. Pretty special there. Jerry Judy, Jedrick Willis, Alex Leatherwood, Henry Ruggs, Najee Harris. That's just day one. Fedarian Matthews, Avery McKinney playing really well. Brian Robinson made a really good career for himself in the NFL. Isaiah Bugs still around. I mean, I don't know how you top that. 2016, you look at the Hurts class. I felt like that one really kind of laid the foundation. Josh Jacobs, I remember – was a guy they just kind of dug up, right? You look back, and that one was one that uh, Jacobs kind of surged late in the process. Alabama's smart enough to pivot, get him in the boat. And then how about 2013, man? You think of all these guys, Jonathan Allen, Derrick Henry, 
Alvin Kamara, who originally signed uh, with the Tide before transferring to Tennessee, Eddie Jackson, who I love, and then Ruben Foster, who I think a lot of people had a lot of high hopes for, didn't work out in the NFL. And then you talk about the ID and evaluation process. O.J. Howard was one of those guys along with A'shaun Robinson. So it's, um, you know, I talk about it all the time just in terms of it's so easy to just look at this and th that this be the expectation in terms of what you expect for a school to do year in and year out. And a lot of people say, well, it recruits itself under Nick Saban. He has all the titles, whether it's a national title or SEC championship. He develops all these first rounders. Sure, that creates momentum, but these recruitments were still very difficult. I can go back and look at every single one of these, whether it's Devontae Smith with LSU, you go down the list to a tag of ILO as well with Oregon. These were all very difficult recruitments that Alabama really kind of had to dig in and they had to go win. Not a lot of these guys were just outright, hey, you know, kiss the ring. I get it. We're going there. We're going to get developed. I'm going to be a first round draft pick. So they talk about the process a lot and they talk about it for a reason. The process is not just going through your process and, hey, this is the guy that fits us. This is a guy that we think is going to fit on and off the field. Let's sign him up. You still got to go out there and you got to get the guy, execute, and make sure he signs on the dotted line as well. Yeah, I, I'm trying to recall that 2017 class. All right, so Devontae Smith, you know, Miami was involved there with Mark Richt. I mean, Tua. You had Lane Kiffin flying all the way out to Hawaii. Uh, that's back when he was doing those uh, like emojis on, on Twitter every time he would visit somewhere. Mac Jones was a flip from Kentucky uh, for that second quarterback. Jerry Judy, Florida's big three, wanted him. Jedrick Wills, Notre Dame, uh, a bunch of other schools that were involved with him. Alex Leatherwood, another kind of uh, big three battle. Henry Ruggs, Najee Harris. I mean, Najee Harris, he was the one where he was just going to get on a plane, right, after the All-American Bowl and show up at the school of his choice. So, yeah, I think maybe when you look at, all right, combination of guys that have panned out, right, I mean, how many people have a recruiting class with two first-round quarterbacks in it? I know you can argue their success on Sundays and, and, and whatever you want, but uh, both those guys were selected then. Uh, three first-round wide receivers, uh, a first round running guy. It's, it's kind of it's kind of crazy, Cooper. Uh, and I think you also need to look at this upcoming uh, NFL draft, right? So you go to Alabama's 2021 ranked recruiting class. They could have four first rounders: J.C. Latham, Dallas Turner, Kool Aid McKinstry, Terry and Ar Arnold. Like all those guys are consistently in these early mock drafts, and that comes after the 2020 recruiting class, which was Bryce Young, Will Anderson. Brian Branch and Drew Sanders. I mean, Brian Branch, Will Anderson having a heck of uh, rookie seasons in the league. And then they also had Chris Braswell and JV and Cohen in that 2020 group. Both those guys are going to be at the Senior Bowl uh, later this month. Yeah, it, it's pretty astounding uh, to see Alabama. It was about three or four guys uh, a year in terms of the first round at that clip. To continue that standard of excellence, especially when it comes to player development, Najee Harris, Alex Leatherwood, I believe those were kind of like Harbaugh's first couple years. Those were guys he was taking swings at head to head with Alabama. Funny to see how the game has changed. Harbaugh now with the national championship, potentially on his way to the NFL. And now Nick Saban off for the afterlife, I guess, if you want to call it that. We'll just call it retirement. Right. So, guys, just a reminder, I know you're locked into the 24-7 uh, sports football recruiting podcast but how about every monday the 24 7 sports football recruiting show that will take place at five o'clock eastern time as well emily proud blair angulo been struggling with that pronunciation glad i finally got that right you can find them here on the 24 7 sports youtube channel guys please make sure to like and subscribe drew before we get out of here the last thing we'll touch on today the transfer portal it just hasn't stopped right it keeps spinning and keeps spinning and keeps spinning i remember one time we we're on the show then the last couple of weeks, we were talking about Cam Ward. I believe it was right after signing day. It might have been even the signing day recap show. And I said, hey, as of right now, we're kind of hearing Cam Ward turn into Miami. Then we came on uh, maybe a week or two later. We had to walk that back. He had declared for the NFL. Then we had heard, hey, maybe it's not done yet. Well, it's not done yet. Cam Ward at this point now committed to Mario Cristobal in the Miami Hurricanes, the number three quarterback in the transfer portal, the number 10 player overall. Threw for over 3,700 yards at Washington State last year, a little bit of an up-and-down season, but you turn on the tape 
of Cam Ward, Drew, I think instantly you and I kind of got together and said, hey, if there was a collegiate prospect, that was our guy that kind of fit into that day two mold, maybe early day three. But if he came back for school, has a chance to maybe play himself into a, a day one draft pick, that would be Cam Ward. Now you insert him into Mario Cristobal's program uh, and think about how he fits. I think it was just last week I was talking about, hey, Miami, what are you doing at quarterback? I think they knew what they were doing, Drew. The huge pickup for the Canes and Mario Cristobal. Now the outlook of this team, I don't know how, uh, I don't know about you, feels completely different in 2024 than it did just a week ago. Well, I think people forget, Cooper, right? Miami opens up in the swamp against Florida Labor Day weekend. I was already making plans uh, to – to be, to be there, right? Like that was kind of the game I had circled. And now Cam Ward, it's like, uh, I'm fired up because I was wondering who was going to be the guy for Miami, Ja'Curry Brown, Emory Williams, Reef, Poff, what do they call him, Poff Daddy. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was going to be an intriguing storyline, but you can just pencil Cam Ward in as the starter for the Hurricanes. And Cooper, this is might sound a, you know a bit outrageous of a take, but you're looking for like a Heisman Trophy long shot future. Why not Cam Ward? I mean, he, he cannot be on the in the top ten. Uh, peak at the schedule. You know what Miami has returning, and Cam Ward can run the football a little bit. He can move around. I I, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. It does change the outlook, and you've touched on it in the past. Mario Cristobal needs to win in year three, and this is. Uh, about as big of a get uh, as there's been the entire transfer portal cycle. Uh, Coop, this is also getting super confusing. You know, we get all these announcements, and then it's like you I can't even keep track of what, who's transferred where, who's flipped. You know, we got transfer flips, uh, guys going to the NFL, guys not going to the NFL. It's, it's beyond confusing. I, I, I always go back to, you know, the senior bowl does that that watch list, and, and Jim Nagy, the director, I think he was on a podcast – um a while ago and he says when we when we have to put out our watch list which is about of like 600 players um they send you know they got guys listed at the wrong school because they can't keep track of it and they can't keep track of it i can't keep track of it like isaiah hastings uh the former alabama defensive lineman he was committed to missouri now he's going to syracuse it's just it's all crazy to me there's a little bit of it that feels kind of like one pandemonium Two, it feels like NBA free agency a little bit. The other thing we'll talk about this in a second, you know, our friend Matt Zinitz and Tom Loy, they're out there breaking transfer portal news, the best in the business, by the way. And now you're seeing the agencies being tagged in this, which blows my mind. That's where we are in college football. We kind of knew it was getting out of control. Hey, it's a business decision. These are the guys. Uh, so-and-so agency uh, tells 24 seven sports that were committed the hell are we doing what are we talking about but that's where we are especially in the in the day of college football it's like man a lot of these guys haven't taken snaps we're still waiting on but we got the agency out there telling them hey you know here's my thing those guys are getting a little piece of the pie too i don't know who these people are that are advising these guys on these decisions really doesn't make a lot of sense to me you know but we want to uh we want to sacrifice the long-term development of the player for a little piece of pie in the short term that's that's the issue right now with college football. I could talk all day on it, but that's what we're seeing right now. And one of those players that came out with that was Isaiah Bond, transferring from Alabama to Texas. I understand why you would do, do it. The agency was tagged in that post. And Isaiah Bond, the leading receiver for Alabama last year, 48 receptions, 668 yards receiving, only four touchdowns. Alabama, in terms of a passing attack, Jalen Milrow, certainly known for his ability to throw the deep ball as well. Isaiah Bond benefited from that. But, Drew, he's transferring to Texas. Texas, I got told the other day uh, from a coach in the industry, if you get in the ring with Texas and Oregon when it comes to NIL, good luck, because those teams are in a completely different realm uh, when it comes to that game. So Texas, they get in the ring here with Isaiah Bond. They land a commitment from them. And then you think about what they have at the receiver position, a lot of talent but a lot of inexperienced talent, right? Jonte Cook, uh, DeBose as well, DeAndre Moore, Ryan Niblett, uh, Matthew Golden, the transfer coming over from Houston, Ryan Wingo, the five-star that we like a lot. Like I said, a lot of people with a lot of ability in that room, but a lot of guys that are unproven, they needed some experience. They get that with Isaiah Bond. Do you remember when Isaiah Bond or like at one point was rec being recruited to play DB at Alabama? It's just been uh, it's been fun to watch how how this has played out. And at times he was 
the true vertical threat for the Crimson Tide. And I go back to his recruitment as well. I mean, he was like silently committed to Miami at one point, and now he's going to try to resurrect his career. I mean, not resurrect it, but I, I guess take the next step at uh, at um, in Austin. I don't know. I, I was fired up because I was ready for Jonte Cook to get some targets in that in that Longhorns passing attack. But no, it makes it makes Texas better, right? It's another weapon for them, um, and it's going to push the other guys in that in that wide receiver room there. And you think about Quinn Ewers coming back, Arch Manning waiting in the in, in the wings. Uh, it makes sense to me. It's just I don't know. I smile every time I see Isaiah Bonds name come up because he was one where we debated behind the scenes at 24 seven sport. Like, do we list him as an athlete? Uh, and I was always under the impression that Nick Saban wanted Isaiah bond as a defender uh, to patrol all those or, or to match up with all those fast slot receivers that everyone was trying to roster in the sec. Well, look, now he's uh, now he's, now he's one of those fast slot receivers and Texas is moving into the sec. Same debate that's currently going on with top two, four, seven receiver and five star receiver Terry Bussey. I should say athlete, right? There's some teams recruiting him as a receiver. Some teams say he, he's, he's going to visit Georgia. Did you see that? What's that? He's he's taking an official visit to Georgia after the Poly Bowl. No, I, just... I, I did not see that. It's it's hard to keep up. It it is one of those times in the calendar that's kind of sneaky. You kind of let your foot off the gas pedal a little bit. You're done with the national championship signing day uh, in, in February. The second one is a little bit sleepier, but there's still a lot of bullets flying right now. Still a lot of things going on. And if you look up, you couldn't miss a five-star potentially going to Georgia, going to take a visit there as well. Drew, a little off script here. don't mean to catch you off guard before we got on the show. Former top 247 standout Des Ricks from IMG Academy. He enters the transfer portal, played one year at Alabama, was a guy uh, highly sought out between LSU and Alabama, came down to the wire before he committed and then signed with the Crimson Tide. He's now in the portal. What's interesting about this one, I believe he had two visits uh, lined up, one of them being at LSU. This is kind of what I was talking about. That visit is now canceled. Now the teams in it are Texas A&M, Ole Miss, and Oregon. So if you want to read between the lines here, let me just say it, if, if – if, you're saying, hey, what is Cooper talking about right now? It's a money game, right? That is the world that we are living in right now. That is the reality. And I guarantee you a lot of conversations taking place, visits set up prematurely. Hey, what's the number going to be? We can't match that. All right, we're going to move on to some teams that we think can. Drew, just your overall take. I don't mean to put you kind of like on the on the hot spot here, but I mean, it's that's where we are, especially when it comes to um, – I used to feel like, hey, maybe it's only – uh, the, the the top few percent of the roster. Now I think we're working our way down where, I mean, we got 85 guys on scholarship. you got to figure out a way to account for every single one of those guys financially in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And I think you got to, you got to make a baseline for your two deep uh, and whatnot. Coop, what I wanted to ask you, right? So let's say you're running a, a personnel department. These blue chippers, that maybe in the past you thought you didn't have a chance with, would you just be trying to visit as many of those guys as you could as, as, uh, as high schoolers? I mean, because there's a good chance you can win them in the secondary recruitment. And uh, yes, I know, I know the dollar sign is going to be a big driving factor on that, but it seems like there's kind of an advantage to, all right, well, we might not get this kid, but let's at least get, some FaceTime with him and, and and start building that relationship. So when he's in the portal a year from now, we're, we're ready to make a move. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a lot of what you're seeing already. Let's get you on campus. Let's make our pitch. Maybe we're not there financially yet, but hey, if it doesn't work out at set school, we'll see you in a year or two. And the other thing about this, Drew, how about the, the coaching turnover year after year? And you look at Jed Fish from Arizona to Washington. A lot of people thought uh, T-Mac and Noah Fafita were going to join him there in Seattle. That doesn't look like that's going to happen. But he's got a relationship with a guy like Parker Brailsford, a, fre a true freshman at Washington who started all 12 games as a center. Now, how does that come into play, right? And when you got teams like Alabama and his former offensive line coach now lurking. So I think that's another fascinating element to this as well. And I think you're going to see – um, more teams, trip players, especially the ones that they're interested in. Drew, I mean, and think about it this way. Is there something there to like what Alex Galesh is doing at, at South Florida? 
right? There's a lot of those guys that they have gotten on campus that you would say, hey, those are two talented of players that South Florida is not going to land the first time around. But there is some strategic value in saying, you know what? If I can get everybody from said school, let's call it IMG Academy, to visit campus, and we know that we're going to swing and miss on 98% of these guys. But we also know that the numbers work out in our favor and that 50% of these guys who stepped on campus are more than likely going to enter the transfer portal at some point in their career. It makes a lot of sense to take that calculated shot, invest that short amount of time that it takes, get some face time and say, hey, if you ever need a home, we're here waiting for you. And the other thing I'd be doing is height, 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 weight, height, weight, arm length uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, like an impromptu physical for some of these guys. And I'd be storing that in a database. No, I, I agree with you, Cooper. Now, I think you've got to draw the line somewhere, right? You know, maybe you're one of these programs. You don't want to be uh, bringing in everyone. But, yeah, I think uh, maybe your premium positions, uh, some of those guys looking looking for them on the bounce back. Um, and another school like Tulane, like Tulane, Shaz Preston comes from uh, Alabama. They, who else did they get? Uh, Mario, Mario Williams. Williams. From USC. It just seems like the parity is at an all time high. Oh, you think about Ty Thompson coming over from Oregon as well, right? I mean, who he's going to be throwing the ball to that is now a, a power five receiving core. Uh, and then you think about the quarterback that they plug in there as well. So I applaud teams like uh, South Florida. John Summerall at Tulane as well, being very aggressive in terms of what they've been able to do. And guess what? They he, He's given a lot of credit to his NIL collective already at Tulane, the type of guys that they've been able to bring in. So we'll see what happens there if other group of five schools will follow. Drew, like I said, it's not all transfer portal right now. And I, I don't know about you. I expect it this time of year in January to maybe be a little bit slower than it's been. It it's, has not been, right? It's been a little bit of a, a ripple effect. Uh, now with Nick Saban and Kalen DeBoer and Jed Fish and so on and so forth. So the wheels keep turning here a little bit. But on the high school level, we rarely talk about anymore. How about Julian Lewis, the former number one player in the 2025 class? He recycles this morning to 2024, the USC commit from the state of Georgia, Carrollton High School, one of the best resumes there is out there per any position, but especially at the quarterback position. Drew, we've seen this guy live a couple of times. We've seen him throw the rock. You look at USC's quarterback situation now more than ever, it says, all right, we, we, we've kind of seen this in the works. If you, if you kind of do your due diligence on Julian Lewis, it makes sense that he would reclassify. But you got Miller Moss there and you got Jade Maeva and Malachi Nelson. He's off to Boise State. So that once a very talented quarterback room in Los Angeles seems like there is a void for a guy like Julian Lewis to step in and at least sell the idea of saying, hey, Julian Lewis, we feel like you can come in here and compete from day one for the starting job. Yeah, we'll move into 2025, not not 2024. I think you said 2024. It's all good, all good. Uh, look, he's the first big name in the 2026 cycle to reclass. Julian Lewis will certainly not be the last of it. We keep saying that this trend is here to stay, and I think especially with the quarterback position, field goal posts have moved, right? The dream or the goal for many is no longer, hey, I got to get to the NFL as fast as possible. It's let's get to uh, college fast as possible. And yes, Julian Lewis, now a member of the 2025 class, we pegged him or I should say moved him. He debuts in those 2025 rankings at number 14 overall, number four quarterback. And I actually went through and charted all of the quarterbacks that we have in the top two, four, seven for the 2025 cycle. Uh, Julian statistically ranks up there uh, near the top in a lot of different categories. I mean, this is a guy that has played a ton of football in Georgia's highest classification. And that's why he is ranked so high. I mean, we're talking about someone that is 25 and three uh, at Carrollton played for a state title as a freshman, didn't get as far in the playoffs here as a sophomore, but he's a Max Preps National Freshman of the Year, Max Preps National uh, Sophomore of the Year. Won't have the opportunity to be the Max Preps Junior of the Year, but I guess he can win uh, the national award this upcoming fall. Cooper, 10.12 yards per attempt. That's one of the best marks out there. Signifies, hey, he pushes – the ball down the field and then that 25 and three record you know we we want winners so julian lewis coming in at number four in our quarterback rankings he's behind bryce underwood 
He's behind George McIntyre. Uh, then he's behind Ohio State commit Tavian St. Clair. All three of those guys are over six foot three, uh, multi sport athletes. Julian Lewis, I think the big knock on him right now is going to be, you know, might not be the biggest individual listed at six one. I think he's a little bit closer to six foot, um, but he can he can whip it around the field, right? He he can throw on the run, distribute it, um, and I, I you know he's. He's going to be it's going to be fun to see how these quarterbacks, you know, the jockeying between them, because remember, now we can get Julian Lewis at this upcoming Elite 11 finals and then he's going to play uh, his his final season. So he's going to leave high school as a three year starter. I think that's why we feel uh, good about him. A lot to like from a cerebral standpoint as well. You get around him and uh, Drew, I think you make a good point when you compare him to the other three quarterbacks. I think a lot of people would say, well, he's moving from 26 to 25. Uh, how do you justify a 13 spot drop? Well, listen, at the end of the day, Bryce Underwood is a guy that we feel very good about, not only from a physical standpoint, but he's played a lot of football and technically a guy that could be a 2026 as well. You go down the list, George McIntyre, multi-sport guy, average uh, more than 10 points uh, on the hardwood as well. And a guy that's got a ton of room to grow physically. And then Tavian St. Clair, maybe one of my favorite guys in the class currently committed to Ohio State. All those guys have a physical trajectory, a clear path in front of them. Uh, that seems quite obvious, right, when you watch these guys and then you marry it up, seeing them in person. The one knock on Julian Lewis is, Drew, is I think it's more high floor than ceiling. Uh, so, yeah, you might get a guy that could step in and, and for right now, let's call it L.A., and be able to be experienced enough uh, to go in and compete day one. But in terms of how that projects to NFL upside and Sunday upside, which is our job to evaluate that, I think that's going to be a looming question for him down the line. Uh, and, and quite honestly, you know, that's going to be something that we're going to have to figure out with him over the next year or so. Yeah, I mean, he's a full field reader, right? Like, I think he's tailor-made for an up-tempo attack Hey, that wants to throw it 35, 40 yards a game, get the playmakers involved. Like, I think he fits Lincoln Riley's system uh, to a T. Now, here's the thing. You know, Steve Wolfong, director of recruiting at 24-7 Sports, he's reported that uh, a number of other schools are, are looking at Julian Lewis. Georgia is involved. Um, uh, Indiana, have you seen Indiana listed in a few of these articles? I think that that's pretty funny. Um, Alabama, I mean, there's a bunch of, of people that – uh, are looking at Julian Lewis. So he's also one you need to track to see where does he end up, you know? Uh, I think Lincoln Riley, you know, maybe maybe some pressure under that seat where that could open the door for a, another program to make a move. And we have no idea what uh, the coaching carousel is going to look like in <laughs> this time next year in, in terms of the moving pieces with Julian Lewis. Hey, hey Coop, you said it. Uh, Bryce Underwood and Julian Lewis, I think they are one month apart in age. They are both 16 years old. So, like, uh, they are the same age. And, and, and you look at Bryce, he has started 40 games um, at, at, at the prep level there up in Michigan. So let's play a little hypothetical, and then we'll get out of there on this note. We've talked a lot about Kalen DeBoer and Alabama, right? You, you think about the three quarterbacks ahead of Julian Lewis in 2025. You got Bryce Underwood currently committed. Uh, to LSU. He's off the board. George McIntyre, it seems like he's going to make a decision uh, relatively soon here with Tennessee uh, being in a really good spot for him. Alabama also uh, in a spot. We'll see what happens with uh, Kalen DeBoer now in the driver's seat, Tavian St. Clair to Ohio State. In your opinion, how would a guy like Julian Lewis, if he ever did come off his commitment to USC, fit in a Kalen DeBoer Alabama offense? I want to know what's going to happen with Austin Mack, right? Austin Mack in the transfer portal. Um, I, I, I think we saw it with 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 Penix, right, in terms of what he was able to do with that all-star cast of wide receivers, some of which you recruited in your time when you were uh, there in Seattle. Um, I, I think it would it would make sense to me. Um, but you know what 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 happens with Ryan Grubbs after this upcoming year? You know. What does Alabama's offense look like? You, and it seems like anytime there's an opening, Ryan Grubbs is is mentioned um, as not only a play caller but a, a potential head coach. So I think it would it would certainly uh, he could be a fit there in Tuscaloosa, maybe more so a fit than Julian Sayan, who Alabama signed here uh, in the 2024 cycle and went through bowl practices. 
I, I think he would fit that offense maybe a little bit better, but that's just, you know, shooting from the hip, not really diving into the tape. Not a, uh, a would you say it's fair to say that the 2025 cycle, I mean, outside, listen, I, I really like those four names at the top of the board, but once you get past that first series, a relatively like strong class, right? You kind of go down the list a little bit. Hussan Longstreet, Antoine Hill, Keely Smith. You know, in this class, we've looked at guys maybe like Walker White, who signed with Auburn, some other guys that have emerged late, Ethan Grunkemeyer uh, to Penn State that we have felt, all right, maybe they have another jump in them. Maybe they have another leap. And I'm not, to, I'm not saying that, uh, that couldn't happen, maybe with a name that we don't even know yet. But some of the guys that are on our radar, Drew, I'm not looking at these guys and saying, hey, I don't know if they got that top 32 clay in them. Yeah, I, I'm kind of done. You know, you mentioned it. We're digging into the 20 or we're not digging in. We're finalizing our 2024 rankings here. But doing some preliminary, uh, not research, but scouting of the 2025 quarterbacks. I would agree with you, but I do think there are some uh, there's some movers out there. You know, Deuce Knight, Notre Dame commit. I think he's he's got a, a monster ceiling. Statistically, hasn't been there just yet. Matt Zoller's up in Pennsylvania. Uh, really like what I've seen from him. And then you know, Camario Taylor, Carter Smith. Like, there's some athletic guys out there. I think I think we'll have a better feeling to that question uh, two months from now, right after we get some. Get some camps in us. Get a, get some time to really dig into the group. But yes, right now there's there seems to be a big four at the top, and then a sizable gap. But I there are some some promising names out there. I think. Long way to go, guys. We appreciate you sticking with us today. Like I said, a lot happening in college football, especially at the top of the mountaintop with Alabama, Nick Saban, and Kalen DeBoer. For Andrew Ivins, I'm Cooper Patagno. One last time, make sure to like and subscribe to the show. We will be back here same time tomorrow, five o'clock Eastern time. Stay warm out there. See you next time.